Good morning, everyone. My computer camera chose now to stop working, so you're not going to see my beautiful face. Um, but hopefully everybody can see my slides. So thank you all for coming. I'm just going to do pretty much an overview of eco-psychology, equine therapy. I know some of you know some things about it. Some of you probably have no idea what it is we're doing on the barn. Thank you, everybody who came out last weekend for family day. That was super cool. Um, so yes, eco-psychology, equine therapy. I'm just going to do a brief overview, some history around it, how I uh, got drawn to the field, and pretty much what, what we're doing out there. So this back in the day with my horse, Sunny, and it was horses that did bring me to psychology and um, eco-psychology, equine therapy. Um, initially, I was riding horses. I started in Hollywood as a teenager under the Hollywood sign, actually, and I had a guest come up. And they would be super nervous um, or very kind of in their personality, not really so much their authentic self. And then we'd get them on a horse and we'd go for anywhere from like a two to three hour ride. And I was consistently noticing a reduction in anxiety and increase in confidence. Um, and then people who would come back regularly would really seem to even have a reduction in depression um, more hope and these different positive aspects. So I became really curious about why that was happening and what was happening. Um, from there, I went over to Burbank and started exercising people's horses. And I learned a lot about how we treat animals in this culture. And um, a lot of that is dominance, oppression, and a lot of that is internalized. Um, and it was really fascinating for me to see. I would work with these horses. They would get better with me. I'd be able to ride them, go wherever. And then the owners would come and there'd be this regression. And the owners would um, like wonder, you know, why was, why was this horse working for me and not for them? And what I started to notice was that the owners would come with these fixed assumptions and stories about the horse, about the relationship, and then the horse would respond in kind. So I thought all of that was really fascinating, wanted to learn more about it. And that's really what led me to grad school for clinical psychology. So here's a quick poll. I don't know if I'm going to see this or only Daniel's going to see this, but if you guys don't mind just writing in the chat one word that comes to mind when you hear eco-psychology. I don't think I'm going to see this, Daniel. So maybe you can just read them out. Oh, wait, no, I am. I'm seeing the chat. Great. Empathy. Nature. Nice. Animals. Yeah. Integration of world and health, nice. Interconnectivity, cool. Animals, yeah. So all these things and more, thanks for doing that. Um, let's see. So here is um, an eco-psychology. So it is all, um, it's also kind of takes it to another level of, um, broadening the lens of psychology, which we'll get to in a minute. But here's this quote that I love. Psychology is so dedicated to the awakening of human consciousness needs to wake itself up to one of the most ancient human truths. We cannot be studied or cured apart from the planet. So there's definitely this um, kind of idea of broadening our environment. Um, sorry, where is my...
So from ego to ego, our evolution from independence and back to environmental co connectivity. Uh, ego here, and this is something we give to the kids when they um, first get to ascend to. We have a whole notebook, and this is one of the um, pictures that we like to show them. This is how we're organized now, right? With man on top and then everything else pretty much at our disposal um, per use, right? It's a very capitalist approach as well. And then this is eco, which is everything being on equal terms. So this um, on the right here, eco, that is basically indigenous wisdom. And I should have probably mentioned before, most of eco psychology is indigenous wisdom. And it's basically just broken down into like, what white people can understand <laughs> um you know it's for wait nikki i'm sorry one thing can people not see nikki's screen it said margaret asked her to share it again i can see it okay i can see it sorry go ahead margaret can you see it are we good yeah now i can sorry that was okay. my error no problem okay um anyway yeah so just keeping in mind where we're at now, where we came from, and what's happening with the planet and our mental health under this more like ego approach. Um, eco psychology draws from evolutionary psychology, and it really highlights that most of our time on Earth as humans, we lived as tribal people in small communities, and we were highly interdependent with the environment and the land. But for the last couple of centuries, we've begun to separate ourselves from our environment. And uh, there's been a lot of problems with it, as you can tell. Not only is the planet at risk, but our mental health, our youth, et cetera, is really in trouble, as all of us who work in mental health know very well. So this is just um, a little bit of a timeline. So. For all of these years, we thrived, right? And, and when we were working intimately within our environment, humans were not born with claws or fangs or you know warm coats. We're actually a very fragile species and we rely heavily on each other. Um, and we also rely heavily on our connection with other species on this planet, although we sort of turn our back on that lately. So about 180 years ago, we bleed ourselves from our environment and we have observed a marked increase in psychological pathologies. Um, so here's a little timeline. I'm going to go over to just sort of highlight how eco-psychology came about and why it kind of considers itself to be the natural evolution of psychology. Freud, as we all know, our buddy, 1890s, psychodynamic theory, it was very individual focused, right? He didn't want any family in the room, um, felt that that would contaminate the process. He did actually kind of as a side note, notice that when he had his dog in the room, his patients were more comfortable. And he did write a bit about that. Um, so yeah, so he thought that pathologies occurred independently and uh, family, loved ones, mother was all left out of it. And then we get into Bowlby, attachment theory, um, started to focus on the relationship between the mother and child, that that's significant. So now we're thinking of self as not individual, but formed um, with another, but just kind of the one other. Then Bowen, we start to get into family systems. So that psychological lens is expanding from individual to just the parent, the primary parent to the whole family. And then Dalton, which Obviously, you guys know there's not just one person responsible for these theories, but these are just the ones I highlighted here. Um, Dalton, 1960s, with feminist theory, starts to look at intersection of race, socioeconomic um, status, and family, and where you're living, 
um, and that the influence of this has to be accounted for when we're trying to treat someone. And of course, gender, et cetera. So then in the 1990s, Greenway comes in and says, yes, we need to look at all of these previous things, mother or family, um, place within culture. But we also need to look at uh, where are we in relation to our natural environment. And so these questions um, become, what is your relationship to the earth in general, right? How connected do you feel? Who is the last person in your family that really worked directly with the land? What is your relationship with, um, with food? How aware are you of where your food comes from? Do you grow it yourself? What is that like for you? And then also what is now commonly known as eco-anxiety, how aware are you and how affected are you by um, the degradation of the planet? Mm -hmm. So here's Greenway, who's known as the father of eco-psychology. He originally called it psychoecology, which was not very catchy. <laughs> um, and then here's Mary Gomes, who was a major influencer on the eco-psychology movement, and Theodore Rozak, who I think you guys got recommended his book, um, which is like the Bible of um, eco-psychology. It's called Healing the Earth. So uh, Mary Gomes and a couple others were meeting with Greenway and Theodore Rozak, um, and they basically came up with eco-psychology uh, in the 90s. And it was born from the kind of renewed green movement, but it was also the acknowledgement that there was an ecology movement. People were looking at the earth um, out of the 60s, out of the... Uh, um, necessity to look at human rights and uh planetary rights etc um there was a lot of attention on that but there wasn't this sort of molding of ecology and psychology and how the two affect each other what kind of thinking and um mindsets and pathologies lead to a culture that's going to destroy its home basically and if you think of that on more of a micro level, if we had a kid come in whose house was a total disaster, whose parents couldn't keep the house free of chemicals and um, clutter and dirt, and there was no regard for their immediate environment, we would take that as, you know, a very big red flag for pathology. And in extreme cases, the child might even be removed from that environment. So essentially, we are doing that to the earth, right? We're poisoning it, we're trashing it, um, plastic island, et cetera. But it's become so normalized that we're not really um, thinking of it as a big problem. And also not just normalized, but bigger than anybody can take on, right? It's super overwhelming to try to think about how we're gonna write some of this. Um, and then again, in terms of eco-psychology, that's a lot of stress. That's a lot of underlying subconscious stress that we're all suffering from. So here is, any questions, comments so far? Everybody okay? Everybody awake? Yeah, okay. Um, so here is these two branches that we really um, use and practice at, Ath at Ascend, ecotherapy and equine therapy, slash animal assisted therapy, because as you guys know, we have our goats and our sheep and our chickens. Ecotherapy, it's not psychotherapy, and it's not trying to replace that or psychiatry, uh, but it does challenge both modalities to reconceptualize their view of human nature, suggesting that our healing must include the healing of the earth. So we can't have um, healthy kids on a sick planet is another way to say it. Ecotherapy activities may range from hikes or meditations. Um, 
and conservation efforts, all of those things we do at Ascend. And there is also a lot of um, research to back all this stuff up. I don't want to get into too much of that. But for example, growing body of research highlights the positive benefits of connecting with nature. And in a study by Terry Hartig, participants uh, were asked to complete a 40-minute cognitive task designed to induce mental fatigue. Following the task, the participants were randomly assigned 40 minutes of time to uh, spend in nature, one on, under three different conditions. So one was walking in nature, one was walking in an urban environment, actually, and then another one was sitting quietly while reading magazines. And the participants who had walked in nature reported less anger, more positive emotions than those who engage in activities in the other activities. So this probably isn't surprising to anyone, right? Because for the most part, we all observe this, that when we get out in nature, when we spend time with animals, we feel better. Um, and again, there's a lot of empirical evidence and um, uh, research that backs this up but it's not being really looked at or acknowledged. Um, just sort of as a segue, when I started working on my dissertation, I thought, which I did on eco-psychology, I thought, aha, I'm going to prove, I'll do, I'll design an experiment where I'll prove how effective equine therapy is on people. But when I started to look into the research, I saw that there was already ample research on that like libraries full of it but it's not really being acknowledged and that's for a variety of reasons um one aspect is really does come down to that sort of big farm capitalism part in uh england where they have socialized medicine it's cheaper for them to prescribe like what's called this green therapy versus giving out pills and in England, where they do this, so the kids, it has to be unstructured play. So it's called Green Hour. And um, it's an hour where the kids are just in nature, right? Some kind of nature. It can just be a field. It can be anything, but not like a sport, not an organized sport, not um, a set playground. So they'll assign the kids, depending on how acute their symptoms are, an hour of this green therapy and then they can sit for school and then they'll do it again after school and then they can do their homework. And so um, ADHD med medication is prescribed at a much, much lower rate in England than it is over here. So it's interesting. Um, okay, moving on to equine therapy. Um, Equine therapy, horse therapy, uh, boosts confidence, forms healthy boundaries. Anybody who's come out to the farm knows all about the uh, boundary teaching effectiveness of our horses, especially Blanco. Um, they will they'll check your boundaries, and if you don't have them, they'll point them out. It's not personal. They're just um, pretty much saying, are you the one in charge here or am I the one in charge? And that's really just for their own safety. They want to know who's going to be able to make a decision here if a bobcat or a mountain lion or an angry human comes at us. We all want to move and go in the same direction for our safety. One of us needs to be able to make that call. And so if they see that you are uncertain in yourself um, or that you're showing up in an inauthentic way, they're going to basically just test you a little bit and that might be nipping at you that might be pushing at you um but they'll want to see where your boundaries are and that's um huge for the kids to have that kind of instant biofeedback okay so here we are oops understanding the connection earth and mind um, so this is really kind of drawing out the lens again to look at 
the state of our planet, our kind of everyday assumptions and interactions with nature, with our food, with animals, and how that's really affecting us and our children. Here we have eating disorder, asthma, mental health, fears and biases. Again, it's kind of preaching to the choir with you guys, um, since we're all in this mental health field, but the disconnect from where food comes from, right? What food is for, um, how we, again, going back to the evolutionary point, how we always made food um, together as tribes, as community, how there was this sacred um, act of preparing and you know hunting or gathering, um, the idea of the honorable harvest, which is uh, the indigenous idea of not taking more than you need and always asking for permission. All of that is gone, right? Our kids go into the store. We go into the store and we buy something wrapped in plastic. We don't have any um, thought of where it came from, what animals died, what was their life like, what, you know, who planted these vegetables, what, um, what was the skill set or the intention behind it. None of those, all of these concepts are out the window and almost seen... I think by and large is kind of hokey, even right or in, not important. But what is the outcome of that? The outcome is we have a huge percent of our culture who is starving themselves, overeating, essentially killing themselves with food. Um, and we, we just sort of think of it as normal or... Um, just so used to it so this is again I think as practitioners and as adults and parents it's really important to start to bring these concepts into mind kids do what they see and not what we tell them to so when they see us destroying the planet and having little knowledge of how to be good stewards not having any kind of sacred interaction with our food that's what we're teaching them to do. And then we can send them to therapy and try to tell them to do something different, but what are we really modeling? And then it gets difficult because what was modeled to us, right? So we're several generations in now of this um, very intense narcissistic, um, anthropocentric way of, commun of communing with our environment. So... Because eco-anxiety is so prevalent and is increasingly being acknowledged by the API, it's important to screen for this with clients. And this can also be very um, unconscious too. So kids might come in and you say something along the lines of, you know, what's your relationship with nature? Do you like animals? When's the last time you went on a hike? And the kids are like, you know, I don't care about nature. Animals are fine. You know, I don't like hiking. Um, but underneath, it's likely that most of these kids have grown up with a sense that there is global warming, that our oceans um, are at risk, et cetera, et cetera. So this is weighing on them on a conscious or unconscious level. The ecological unconscious is just that. It's um, that these ideas are repressed and this repressed material obviously becomes symptomatic or can. Okay, here's another quick poll. So what's one way that you enjoy connecting with nature? And if your answer is, I don't enjoy nature, that's totally okay too. We won't, I'll try not to shame you too terribly.
So everyone hiking in the mountains, camping, nice. Running, hiking, going to the beach, being in the ocean. Visiting gardens, that's nice. Lots of ocean people here <laughs> playing with bugs, Kim, nice. Hiking, cool. So it seems like most everybody does enjoy sitting in my garden, communing in some way, which is great. So really this is, you know, anybody who's interested in bringing these eco-psych concepts into your work, this is where you start, right? Just sort of tuning in and becoming even more aware and more conscious of how you enjoy connecting to nature and the benefits that you feel when you are connecting to nature. Um, and then <clears throat> bringing that into your practice just as simply as I see many of you doing, meeting with your kids outside, going over to the barn and meeting with them in front of or around the horses, also using um, metaphor can be really helpful. Um, like. Uh, nature metaphor for example one of my favorite ones that i was talking to daniel about is this idea it's also sort of a um, eastern philosophy one but this idea of the waves in the ocean right so we're each waves right and we have these um distinct boundaries like each each wave in the ocean is its own wave there's never going to be another wave exactly like that it has a beginning and an end it has unique shape and properties to it, but it is the ocean, right? And I think what's happened to us a lot is that we forget that we are the ocean as well, right? And we think that we're just these waves um, separate from, and that's this, you know, illusion of um, separateness and uh, oops, um, isolation and depression that is so prevalent. Let's see, let me put that chat away. I don't know if I was supposed to be, oh yeah, okay, great. So yeah, this is just kind of a dramatic and beautiful picture of, um, I think what many of us are going through internally, not ex extreme as uh, these people at the moment, but um, there's a lot happening, right? We all had these wildfires a couple of years ago. There's crazy weather everywhere. Um, the APA is acknowledging that there's going to be climate refugees. There was a big conference, I think two years ago, talking about um, how we should be training psychologists to deal with what's coming, which is climate refugees, um, which is gonna show up in, you know, many different ways or could show up in many different ways. Um, so yeah, eco-psychology posits that a large part of our pathology stems from a narcissistic viewpoint that is born from our disconnection to the natural world. Um, Eco-feminism promotes that the contemporary eco-crises have resulted from a patriarchal culture that promotes the violence and destruction of the earth in pursuit of dominance and gain. So again, um, keeping in mind this idea that the way that we treat our animals, the way that we treat the earth, is also the way that we treat humans and each other, and it becomes internalized, and it's the way that our clients and our children treat themselves and each other. And that's one of the things that we do really try to highlight on the farm is this very different approach to working with horses. The traditional way is, you know, grab the horse, stick like a metal bit in their mouth, throw a saddle on them, lead them around, tell them what to do, use them to enhance our status, whether it's um, jumping, right, winning trophies, having them chase cows in the rodeo traditions, uh, but very rarely do we check in, ask for consent, 
try to mentalize the view of the horse. And that's, we do that um, at Ascend. That's like a huge part of what we do, teaching the kids to look for what consent looks like in these animals and for them to notice when for the for the kids to notice when they can't or won't or don't do that and how natural it is to not do that how natural it is in our culture to just think we're going to um use the other for whatever it is that we want and again that internalized piece shows up as you're not worth anything i'm not worth anything like what's the freaking point right so it's a lot of um kind of what starts as narcissism and disrespect and it leads to isolation and despair sorry this is not it's a very cheery subject this morning <laughs> um so here is dualism the big lie and the deep truth Linda Bazell is another uh, influential person in the field of ecotherapy. And I love this quote from her. I actually interviewed her for my dissertation. She said, it's what I call the big lie that humans are separate or superior to the rest of nature. If you want the philosophical origin of our current mess, that would be it. Um, Yeah, so again, just bringing attention to what our norm um, background stories are in our culture. Uh, most people think of the brain and body as separate, right? As these, that was very Cartesian and we're still really living under that. Um, and that the human does not exist, or sorry, but what we're trying to do is to bring attention to the fact that the human does not exist outside the environment, that we are brain, body, emotion, spirit, um, and illuminating this fundamental error in Western approach to both medicine and psychology, which treats symptoms rather than holistic causes. Um, Bazell really points out the connection between dualism and anthropocentric narcissism. Our dualistic thinking has led to increased planetary and personal disease. And she says, um, I love this quote too. Some people take it back to agriculture. Some people take it back to patriarchies. Some people take it back to the industrial revolution and some to Descartes or even Genesis. But the whole idea that God gave us this planet to do whatever the hell we wanted with. Um, there's a lot of places where you can see that in antecedent to our current situation sorry i can't ever say that word antecedent to our current situation um yeah so basically you guys get it i think let's see so advancing ascend what are our green goals for the future um we want to we're in the process of getting a gardening group or really expanding our gardening groups i should say we want to get the gardening groups out to the Encino houses. We want to train the mentors to lead eco hikes that are uh, more mindful with some of these um, eco psychological tenants. Um, we, what else do we want to do? Possibly want to train any um, therapists that are interested. Let me know. Um, the need, um, oh, no, I don't know what's happening. This, hello. <laughs> All right, I'm going to keep going. Um, the need to uh, kind of end this um, illusion of isolation, right? So when we don't know the names of the trees that are growing outside our door or what plants are um, medicinal or nutritional, <laughs> we have this huge separation between us and our environment. But as soon as we start to learn just like the simple ones, like I think pepper trees, I haven't been out to Encino, but I know at the Santa Clarita houses, we have a lot of pepper trees growing there. And as soon as I show what the pepper trees are to the kids, they're so excited to be able to recognize them in other places and the peppercorn. And then they're really surprised that this is the same pepper that we use in our kitchens. 
Um, and so just ourselves becoming educated and oriented to who and what we share our campuses with, I think is a really nice step towards that feeling of integration and um, also just confidence of being in your environment. So they're not just, you know, especially at um, Haven where there's like the oak tree forest there. I love to point out to the kids that we're not really at a house with a tree in the backyard. We're really in an ancient oak tree forest and there happens to be houses here and to start to contextualize ourselves within the environment in that way um the other thing is especially in southern california most things that grow here are either medicinal or nutritional not that we want our kids to like go and start putting everything in their mouths although there's a very very low percentage of actual poisonous um fauna here in southern california but just so that they can start to feel educated and savvy and confident about this environment that they share and feel connected to it. So that's one small way. And then as far as what the clinicians can do um, with their kids, it can be as simple as, you know, having like a fish tank or um, plants in your office. Um, but again, really taking the steps to start to restore your own relationship with nature and then sharing it with the kids from there. So if you come out, for example, to the barn and it's helpful for your client to be around the goats, like getting to know the goats and having a bit of a relationship yourself with them first, right? So you're really modeling. I think that's the biggest thing is really being able to model what does this look like to have this relationship with our natural environment? And then from there, um, either conducting sessions outside or talking to the kids about their animals that they're missing at home, which is often a big thing. Um, uh, mindfulness exercises with breathing, walking, mindful meditation while you're walking, doing these things like before or after your sessions can be really huge and really helpful for the kids. Um, I can also walk you guys through what I would do and the different um, aspects that, oh, sorry, Daniel's saying my Wi-Fi just crashed. Okay. Um, the different theoretical concepts that I integrate through being um, outside and with the horses. So for example, if I'm meeting with somebody individually um, out at the ranch with the horses, I'd use, let's see, first we'd probably start with some deep breathing and really getting in touch with the body, noticing maybe um, the sounds. I sometimes do like a one minute meditation on sound, a one minute meditation on what are you feeling, a one minute, minute on what are you hearing. And then once they're feeling grounded, um, I might ask them to do something like take this horse from, you know, A to B, and then I'll have them assign that journey, right? So this is where you were in the beginning of treatment. This is where you want to get to, or this is your life thus far, and this is your hopes for it moving forward. And then um, they'll maybe assign uh role to their horse so this is their helper or this is their confidence or this is what's holding them back whatever it is and then they walk the horse and if the horse for example doesn't go with them I'll ask them to notice what comes up right and then they might say well I'm getting frustrated or pissed off and then you might then I might say how familiar is that feeling to you and is there a corresponding sensation in your body? And so really bringing awareness to the somatic piece um, so that they can start to be familiar with what pissed off feels like to them. And hopefully they can start to identify it before it's at, you know, a hundred. Um, what is a story they're telling themselves? So we get into some of uh, narrative therapy, maybe even some um, cognitive behavioral therapy, if they're really starting to notice, oh, 
this horse doesn't like me, right? And then you could say, oh, does that show up anywhere else in your life where you think people don't like you? And then nine times out of 10, the answer is, yeah, I feel like that about everybody. So then we're bringing some awareness to their um, thought. And then it's also very psychodynamic oriented because they're assigning metaphors, you know, oh, this horse is sad, this horse is angry, this horse feels like nobody else likes them, um, or their insight into what the journey can look like. So there's a lot of modalities that you can use and bring in with like really simple exercises. I mean, that's mainly what we do is like halt your horse and walk him like, you know, 500 or a thousand feet. And that's like the whole session. And it's really rich. Um, but you can also do it without animals. You can do it just walking around outside and asking some of those same questions, like what's coming up for you right now? How familiar is that? What are you noticing in your body? Um, you know, from there. Is that helpful? Does anybody have, I'd love to answer more questions. That's so helpful. I think one, one thing I'd be curious about is like, and this might be totally, um, you know, like 101 with this intervention, but what if they're like totally resistant? is asking them something that they um, are working on in therapy. And then I'll also ask them coping with skilling. So that's one example. And that's more like the anxiety thing. We'll also have kids who are like, I hate these animals. And they'll really justify to them. Um, they'll say, like, get it away from me or, you know, try to whatever. In those cases, sometimes we will just have them sit out with the hopes that um, the boredom will sort of, you know, be less fun than interacting. Most times the kids end up coming around and participating and even bonding with the animals. Every now and then not. Kaylin knows we have somebody at Haven right now who is just dead set on not participating but it's it's still it's always clinically rich no matter what happens because this individual when I first met him did come to the barn with me he was reporting the smell was bothering him but he was walking a horse and we were fine and having a nice session and then they pretty much um decided to make the barn be their point like their hill that they would die on and so once they decided that they didn't want to be in treatment they weren't going to get anything out of it etc cetera, etc cetera. they really made the the farm um like a no-go for them and you know it is what it is so they've sat out the whole time and haven't gotten anything from the eco program um except for i don't know to sort of dig their heels in more but that's, it's very, very rare. That's actually the first person in two years who's never, who just flat out has not come around. Nikki, can I add something about him? Yes. I think an important piece too, and, and probably why he sticks out is um, there's a lot of like family structural um, trauma and just, it's a really sick family system. And I think there was some support by his dad to not engage. So there was sort of this like alternative and what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, like a dad, way out. Or... Yeah. Like dad was on his side. So dad's the one who sent me here. Right. So it's okay if I don't engage, I think 
I just want to point out that it, it is rare and it usually speaks to just the the illness I, I feel of the family system. And I think that the opposite is true too, right? We see these kids really turn things around and it can really impact the family system. Like farm yeah. behavior is how they interact with their family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. The thank you, Kaylin. Um, yeah, the animals in the farm system really does uh, reflect their their family systems, and and it can really be worked on and healed. Like one of my favorite positive farm stories was from a girl at Canyons who was just came in like hating the animals, shaming the goats, etc. And then she got sent, um, I think she was 50 and 50 for a couple of days. And while she was gone, she was noticing that she was missing the goats or like one goat in particular boots, I guess. And when she came back, she reported to me that that was the first time in her life that she missed or cared about anything or anyone. And that while she was in the hospital, she was noticing that and feeling really sad about that. And then she also noticed how sad it was that the first person or thing that she cared for was this goat and not even herself. And um, so when she came back, we had a lot to work on, but she, you know, her first couple of days at the ranch, it was like a lot of cursing and negative talk and how disgusting the animals are and she can't be around them. And, and that's pretty normal and par for course, but yeah. Um, almost always they end up coming around and bonding with the animals. I'd say like 95% of the time. Anybody else? Any questions? Comments? No. No. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so could you explain a little bit about what a gardening group would actually look like? I mean, obviously we'll be gardening, but how would we like loop in the, the clinical piece of that, I guess, in a gardening group? Yeah. Who's, I'm sorry, who's talking? I can't tell who's talking. Pauline. From, uh, oh, hi, Pauline. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the plan so far is to have um, one of my farm techs go out, Kalia actually, and set up a group. And we want to have a 12-month um, structure that all the houses follow. And that is also based on Indigenous um, farming practices. So uh, we want to have like the Three Sisters. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Three Sisters, but it's corn squash and beans and they all um nourish each other uh one of them makes nitrogen the other one has sh the shade the other one um acts as uh something to climb on or eats too much nitrogen or whatever it is so there are three it's a very important parable in um especially the chumash or the people uh, here in Southern California, the indigenous people, but um, the lessons and bounty of the three sisters is really important to their culture. Um, and there, it's a garden that grows without structure, basically. And when the um, settlers came in, they thought like, you know, what the hell are these Chumash doing? Their gardens are like all over the place. But then, of course, they were able to um, eat their food all year round. So that's a place where we really want to instill um, traditional wisdom and practices. But so we're going to have, like I was saying, 12 months, all the houses on the same cycle, everybody growing the same um, food. And what it'll look like practically is going in, um, helping to set up the beds. So again, I'll have Talia there. You guys won't be on your own with this. That will be a week or two um, and then planting whatever seeds are appropriate for the time of the year and the region. And then 
while those seeds are growing, because there's not like always stuff to do, we'll have other um, activities like identifying uh, different trees and plants that are in the neighborhood or going on local walks or doing um, meditation or like art gardening, you know, different, um, different like what's it like arts and crafts or uh, building bird houses or different things like that. So it's only going to be an hour long, but then also you guys as clinicians, if you want, you'll be able to go out to the garden and run groups there. Is that, is that clear, Paul, Paulina, or do you need more? Yeah, no, that's clear. Thank you. Okay. Well, that might be it then. Um, Thanks, Dr. Nikki. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening. I hope it made sense. Kind do of, you have this PowerPoint as something that you can, I don't know if I missed that part, but yeah. kind of like hand out or any resources to anybody that isn't interested in developing yeah. their understanding? We've got okay. all kinds of things we can get. We also have, um, we have whole binders for the mentors and the, um, the kids that the mentors are supposed to read through when they first get hired and the kids are supposed to see when they arrive, but we can also have a clinician's handbook if you guys want that I can give you. Yeah, you and or you can um you can do that. I'm sure that might take you a little bit of time, but anything that you can maybe send out or sure. you know, in regards like kind of following this to mm -hmm. the the email chain would be really awesome. Okay, yeah, I can definitely do that. I'll send this presentation and anything else that's easy. I, I and Dr. Nikki, is the binder that the kids see, is it on like the Google Drive? Yes, it is on the Google Drive too. Okay, cool. Because I'd love to take a look at that. Nice. See what's in there.